Well, it's good to welcome you, Scott, to Horizons. Uh, thank you for doing this, man. I appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome, John. Good to be with you. So, you know, you're certainly a unique voice, and, and you've had a year. I mean, you wrote a book about, you know, coming out of this pandemic, um, and I'm sure we're going to get into that. But before we do, given, you know, that we've got the Secretary of Labor and Education coming on after us, I thought I'd ask you uh, about the future of work and, in particular, education. This is something that you've written about pretty passionately for quite some time. Um, and, you know, you have a lot of strong opinions. So I'd like to try to pull them out of you. You know, can you give me your best rant on why you're critical of the U.S., particularly higher education system, um, and, and, and what you think is broken about it? Uh, we're going to need a bigger boat. Um, <laughs> so uh, as, I, as I do with any question, I'll use it as an excuse to talk about myself. Uh, uh, 1982, I was the son of a single mother who lived and died a secretary, immigrant mother, who never made more than $38,000. And I was not a remarkable kid. This isn't a story of a kid who got 1600 on the SAT. I got, uh, I think, 1050 on the SAT, which was unremarkable. I had unremarkable grades. I applied to UCLA, and I did not get in. They had a 60% admittance rate when I applied, and I still didn't get in. And I applied in a second time. I applied a second time and they let me in. And I got a 2.3 GPA uh, at UCLA. And I lied about my grades and got a job at Morgan Stanley. And then the University of California took a second chance on me and let me into Berkeley. And from Berkeley, it catalyzed, I got my shit together and it catalyzed an upward spiral of prosperity and tens of millions of dollars of federal income taxes paid. And I worry that over the last 30 years with tuition up 1,400%, and uh, UCLA has now acceptance rate of 9%. And uh, my colleagues have become so drunk on luxury, and we ask ourselves the same thing every day. How do we reduce our accountability and increase our compensation? And the result is their Hermesification of what used to be the greatest upward lubricant of mobility in history, that is the U.S. higher education system, has become the enforcer of a caste system. Hmm. where the freakishly remarkable and the rich get in, you're 77 times more likely to get into an elite university if you're from a top 1% income earning household. There are uh, five of the Ivies have more kids from a top 1% household than the bottom 60%. So we've decided that the spoils of America essentially go to the children of rich people and freakishly remarkable kids. And I can prove to each of us that 99% of our children will not be in the top 1%, and it all comes down to one question for me. What do we want America to be? Do we want America to be a place where we identify the top 1% by income or achievement and say, you should be billionaires, and we're going to do everything we can do to get you there? Or is America what it was when I was coming into college, and that is we want to give the bottom 90% a shot at being in the top 10%? So I think America has lost the script, and I think higher ed is the tip of the spear of that loss of, of the script. Now, what would you, I mean, there's a lot in there. You're right, we need a bigger boat here, but uh, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to pull out a couple prescriptions from you. Um, what, what, what would you have us do? I, I'm also a product of the UC system, and there's no way I would have gotten in, you know, even 20 years ago. I got in 35 or 40 years ago. Um, and the acceptance rates at, at, at I also went to Berkeley are are ridiculous and, a, and and highly touted I would add by by the universities and, and it's a metric they all chase which is how low they can get that that number. What should we do about it? Uh, so first off, uh, let's give up on the Ivy League. They uh, Harvard has decided with an endowment that's the size of the GDP of El Salvador to only let in 1,400 kids this year. So they have $30 million per kid that they let in for the fall. So, uh, you know, what is the point w w is what I would ask Harvard or Stanford when they're sitting on that kind of money and have decided they're not going to increase their freshman class at all. So let's just ignore that. And two-thirds of kids end up at a public university. So if you want to move the needle in America, we got to talk about our great public universities. Florida State will educate graduate more kids this year than the entire Ivy League combined. I think there's an opportunity. So the magic wand test, well, what would you do? I think embracing, with the embrace of small and big tech, we could double the supply of seats at great universities, whether it's the University of Texas, the University of California, the Cal State system, where we could arbitrage two years there, two years 
out of UC school, Michigan, Florida, the great state school systems, in my opinion, could enter into a grand bargain with the states and say, increase our budget 20 percent, and we're going to increase the number of kids we educate by 100 percent. Because everyone talks about the economic costs, but I think the biggest cost being levied on America is the cost of despair. And that is, hmm. it used to be if you played by the rules and your kid was a good kid, they got to go to a great university. Now your kid can be amazing and gets downgraded to a mediocre university, and it's all a giant cartel where at NYU, we bragged that we turned away 92% of the applicants, which is tantamount, in my view, to a head of a homeless shelter bragging he or she turned away 92% of people who showed up last night. And then they go down the, 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 the trough to tier two and tier three schools and ended up paying the price of a Mercedes for a Hyundai. So I think there's an opportunity to say, how do we use big tech? And the reality is, I used to teach 120 kids at Stern because that was the biggest class at Stern. Now I teach 280. Right. The costs have not increased that much. So could we take 50% of our classes online and overnight double the capacity and maybe reduce costs by 30%, 40% per student and dramatically expand um, admissions rates? So I think a defetishization by corporate America hmm. of the bachelor's degree and a, a, a return to this notion amongst my colleagues that we are public servants, not Hermes. I like both those ideas, um, and and you and you touched in the beginning of it on you know you said it's a, the, the education system is the tip of the spear here. Let's talk about the the rest of it. Um, you have been highly critical of the not of capitalism per se, but of the system of capitalism that we have uh, now uh, sort of functioning in the United States and in and I guess across the Western world. Can you give me sort of a potted history of that critique? Uh, and what you think needs to change there? Well, look, we're the apex predator. Our species has won. No other species drives other species out of regions. We can change the weather. We've won. And the construct, our superpower is cooperation. And the thing that leverages our cooperation is capitalism that leverages our self-interest. But capitalism doesn't work unless it sits on a bed of empathy, unless we decide we're going to pay Social Security taxes so old people don't die in the streets or come together to support a U.S. Navy to defend our shores, other people will come take away our Netflix. So capitalism, if it doesn't, if it doesn't sit on a bed of empathy and a certain level of concern, or, or if we don't fund connective tissue called a robust government, it all collapses on itself. And what I see is that when corporations are more profitable than they've ever been in history, and the most impressive corporation in the world, Amazon, registers $20 billion dollars in profits over the last 10 years and pays a 4.5% tax rate, I see a system where capitalism is collapsing on itself. And young people state that a third of them think communism is better than capitalism. And this is wrong. Capitalism is the best of its kind. But what we're seeing right now isn't capitalism. It's cronyism, where people want, want full-throated, you know, rugged individualism on the way up. And then they want socialism on the way down. So the top five biggest airline CEOs pay themselves $150 million in total comp pre-pandemic by taking 93% of their free cash flow to buy back stock that juices their compensation, which is largely based on stock. And then shit gets real in a pandemic, and we're all in the Hallmark Channel, state, and they're all stating we're in this together, and they want to bail out. So we have been, when we look back at this, we're going to realize we should have been much more harsh on companies and much more hmm. empathetic and loving with individuals. We should be protecting people, not companies. And we've decided to create these cartoons of companies where the cupcake bakery just needs a bailout to get the other end. Small businesses should fail. When you save small businesses, you're saving a 50-year-old restaurateur, baby boomer, and you're not giving a 25-year-old that just graduated from the Brooklyn Culinary Academy a, their shot. The reason the reason you're in that fat loft in Tribeca and I live on the beach, John, is because you and I, coming into our prime income earning years, got to buy Apple at 12 bucks a share. The market fell, and we got our shot. Mm -hmm. And all we've done with the stimulus and all we've done with this cronyism is said, you and I want to stay wealthy, and we're not going to give a shot to younger people. The percentage of the GDP by wealth of the, uh, that people under the age of 40 have has been cut from 20% to 9%. For the first time in our nation's history, a 30-year-old man or woman isn't doing as well as his or her par parents were at the age of 30. So we have, we have made a concerted decision 
to pull money from young people and from future generations in the form of irresponsible debt to keep mostly white, mostly male-controlled baby boomers rich. That is our entire objective as a nation right now. And guess what? People under the age of 40 have had it. They've had it. And I think whether it's Me Too, the meme stock movement, Black Lives Matter, these are all righteous movements with their own justification, but the incendiary underlying all of these things is that the compact in America is broken down. Let me ask you the magic wand question again as it relates to this larger topic. What would you do what, if you were you know, king of America or king of the world? What would they be policy changes? Would they be social revolution that you would foment? What, what is it that you would hope to see happen that might start to correct the ills that you've described? Well, just uh, re-cement the notion that we're Americans and that we care about each other and that we're not going to let one in five households with kids be food insecure. And that basics, we've typically until the last 30 years believed in a progressive tax structure. And that when the wealthiest people in America, I mean, I, I'm part of the problem. And the reality is, and the dirty secret of this pandemic is, if you're in the top 1%, much less, much less the top 10%, you're living your best life. Pandemic for most of my cohort has meant more time with Netflix, more time with their children, and they've seen their stock market uh, portfolio explode. That's not to say they're evil people. But it's sort of stop, stop, it hurts so good. And the reason why that's so bad <laughs> is that this virus has not seen what America is capable of when it applies a full-throated capitalist response. Within seven days of Pearl Harbor, we converted the largest Chrysler factory to a factory punching out M1 Bradley tanks, and that one factory produced more tanks than the entire Third Reich combined. If Walmart's stock had gone down 40% instead of up 40%, if someone barreled into their store without a mask, they would have tased them first and asked questions later. If Amazon's stock had gone down 60% and not up 60%, when that van with a smile pulls into my driveway tomorrow morning, someone would have jumped out and jabbed my whole family. Hmm. What have we done here? If, 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 if the NASDAQ had been cut in half instead of artificially inflating it by printing money on the backs of the credit card of future generations, if the NASDAQ had gone 50%, the response to this virus would have made the response in South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore look like amateur hour. Yeah. We have had totally bastardized incentives, and we have outsourced this pandemic to people of color who are overweight. We are living our best lives, and as a result, it has resulted in unnecessary death on a, on a, a scale we have never seen in this country. So I want to summarize the prescriptions, which to me sound like, let's get back to what we used to do. Um, let's have a progressive tax that actually distributes wealth. Let's care about each other and have a shared, uh, a shared narrative of empathy. Uh, you're a branding and a marketing expert. Let me ask you, you know, if, if, the, if, if Uncle Sam came to you and said, help, I agree with you, fix my brand, uh, what would you have Uncle Sam do? Well, uh, so you're right. Uh, the, the way I would describe it is what Bill Clinton said. There is absolutely nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed with what's right with America. And whenever you talk about taking money from the white patriarchy back to younger people, people describe it as radical. So my radical approach would be go to go back to where Reagan was and have no difference between the income that sweat earns, current income, and the income that assets earn, long-term capital gains. The two, the two biggest tax deductions in America are interest on mortgages, who owns homes, older people, who rents, younger people. The second biggest deduction, capital gains. Who owns assets and stocks? Older people, who makes all their money through current income? Younger people. Right. We generally believed in the 60s that the top 1% should pay a 40 to 60% tax rate, then it went to 30 to 40, now it's at 17. So these are not new ideas. Perhaps we should fund the CDC at more than 7 billion. I didn't see any, I didn't see any tanks lined up at the Canadian, American or Mexican American border at $700 billion in, in military spending. But we had a, a, an enemy one four thousandth the width of a human hair take out 600,000 of us. So I think our priorities, I think very basic priorities around government, institution, our connective tissue. We've gone on a 30-year screed since Reagan that government is bad. Government is wonderful. Government turned back Hitler and cured polio and invented 
silly putty. Why? How have we lost? <laughs> how have we lost our love and respect for our connective tissue between our brothers and sisters? I'd move back to NATO. I think the G7 agreement around taxes is wonderful. We're we're the most generous, innovative, loving people in the world. We're also the wealthiest nation in the world. Let's start acting like it. I think there's real signs of progress, a progressive tax structure, deciding earned income tax credit for children, I think is wonderful. And for God's sakes, if we're going to print money and borrow money from future generations, let's bail out people. Let's not bail out companies. Capitalism is meant to be full-throated violence amongst corporations. And not, let's not let big companies and big tech overrun Washington. There are more full-time lobbyists working for Amazon in D.C. than there are sitting U.S. senators. The, the Department of Communications and PR at Facebook manicuring a sociopath and lipstick on cancer, Zuckerberg and Sandberg, is bigger than any newsroom in America. Let's elect people that have the backbone to realize how wonderful government is and serve as a counterbalance to private power. When private power overruns government, that is a key step towards tyranny. And we have been on that path for way too long. Yeah, yeah. I so, sound so indignant. You do. You do. <laughs> You, 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 you know, uh, I, I don't want to ask you to play Professor Galloway's greatest hits, but uh, I remember when your book, The Four, came out. It was only a few years ago, um, and I ate it up. Uh, and I've asked you this before, but I wanted to, to give you a chance to reprise it. Um, what is it about big tech that kind of... Uh, my sense of your own progression, Scott, is that you... You wrote that book, and I think it was a primer for many of the things we've heard over the past 20 minutes that, you know, you first uh, really got your, your, your arms around uh, the four. Um, so tell us, you know, what, how is your view, and you have a lot of podcasts and writing uh, uh, about, about tech, but how has your view of tech evolved since writing that book? And, and, and you know, what do you think the role of these companies uh, is in, in our society, and maybe what should it be? So, the, look, these firms are now more powerful than any organizations on Earth. Mark Zuckerberg's the most powerful person on the planet. Biology will take out Putin. We had Trump go out through democratic process. We have Biden for a maximum of another seven and a half years. A guy who controls the algorithms of amplification that are largely seeking out rage, which equals engagement, which equals more Nissan ads, decides the algorithms to feed the content to a population greater than the Southern Hemisphere plus India. Is that a good thing, that we have monopolies and duopolies that are so powerful that new businesses used to be 15% of all businesses, now they're 7%. That's generally been the big job creator. But the, here's the thing, John. I, I mean, I'm snarky about them, but they're kind of doing what they're supposed to do. A key agent in capitalism is to be a for-profit enterprise that ruthlessly delays and obfuscates and and puts, you know, puts Vaseline over the lens of what they're doing so they can return income to shareholders and build wealth for their communities, their employees, and their shareholders. They're doing their job. It's we that are not doing our job, and that is we don't seem to want to elect people and fund the people to push back on them. I think these companies are doing much worse things than Michael Milken went to jail for 10 years. Mm. We've seen the Department of Justice, the SEC, and the FTC, the IRS, what a shocker. The 25 wealthiest people in the world aren't paying taxes. Well, guess what? When you gut the IRS mm -hmm. and you have an individual who can hire five, 400 accountants, that makes sense that they're no longer paying taxes. So I, I think these companies have effectively are, are, if you will, they're incredibly innovative. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. We need to return to our proud legacy of antitrust and realize that it's not a punishment that when AT&T got to 80% of long distance, it wasn't because they were evil. It was because they were doing their job and leveraging their monopoly power. And we went in and broke them up. And what did that do? It created seven companies that were all more valuable than the original AT&T within a decade. Antitrust is one of the few things we ever get right 1,000% of the time or 100% of the time. So I think this it's easy to be a hater around big tech. They're doing their job. We're not doing ours. It's time to break them up. It's time to hold them to the same standards we've held every other industry over the last 200 years. Well, Scott, thank you so much for your time. We have to end it there. I wish we had more time, but we don't. Um, I'm sure that everyone's going to enjoy uh, your comments, and they will inform the conversations during the rest of the day. So again, thanks so much for joining us at Horizons. Thanks, brother. Take care.